second awarding of the uh, Tandika Amkandawira Young Scholar and um, prize for the um, Outstanding Scholar um, in uh, Africa Political Economy and Economic Development. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Professor Mkandawira um, and why, why we have the prize and um, a bit about his life and the impact that he made on all of us and the, the association of a board um, with um, Professor Mkandawira. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, okay, so just a bit of background on him. Professor Mkandawira was a Malawian political economist who made a fundamental contribution to thinking about African economic development. He had held various positions, including the director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development um, and executive secretary of the Council for Development of Social Science Research in Africa, CODESRA. Tandika was the first person to take on the position of Chair in African Development at the London School of Economics. He was also a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Development Research in Copenhagen, and he taught at both the Universities of Stockholm and in Zimbabwe. Um, further, he was holder of the Ulof Palmer Professorship for Peace with the Institute of Future Studies in Stockholm. His research interests were in development theory, in developing countries and political economy of development in Africa. He passed away in Sweden in 2020, um, where he had lived for many years. Tandika was a lecturer on the Apport program for many years, and he was held in high esteem by the other lecturers and the participants. His knowledge of African economic development was extensive, and he was happy to share his insights with participants on the program. He had a very unique lecturing style and he liked to weave a story in order to make his points, which um, and it was an approach that I think resonated very well with the board participants. Um, and they really enjoyed his, his approach and his style and, and the, the lessons that he could share from um, a lot of experience that he had gained over the years. In 2017, he also delivered the Alice Amston Memorial Lecture and spoke on income distribution as industrial policy. After his passing, the Apport Scientific Committee um, agreed that it would be important to continue his memory by establishing a prize for outstanding scholarship in Africa political economy and economic development, as well as a young scholar prize. Um, through the, the association with the board, as well as um, TIPS and the, the South African Research Chair in Industrial Development at um, University of Johannesburg, we, we've taken forward this prize in his memory, and we've all contributed time, resources um, to make sure that this prize takes place. And, and we're proud that we are able to um, have the second um, prize um, awarded this year, prizes awarded this year. <clears throat> So some background to the prize. Um, in March this year, we issued a call for submissions um, and we um, received a large number of applications or submissions and this, they were judged on the following criteria. Firstly, quality of the research, in particular originality and contribution to knowledge, rigor and clarity and coherence. Secondly, alignment with the theme of African political economy and economic development and with the intellectual legacy of Tandika Mkandawira. Um, it was not required um, for submissions to be explicitly discuss his contributions, however. Okay, the, the winning submissions did, however, need to engage with the spirit of critical inquiry that is associated with his intellectual legacy. There, there are a number of people who we need to thank for all of their, their work, um, particularly professors um, Fiona Tregener and Christopher Kramer, as well as the members of the panel who went through and evaluated the papers that were received. Tonight, we're gonna to hear from both prize winners um, and let me introduce our first prize winner who's gonna talk um, first and then we'll be followed by the second one after which we'll open up for questions and comments, um, both from those in the audience and those that are online. Um, 
just to say that our first presenter, Dr. Eyob um, Gebremariam, um, is going to be presenting virtually, and then Ayabonga Kawe will be presenting um, in person um, at the award uh, venue. Um, some background on um, um, Dr. Ayab um, Gebremayim. Um, he has, is the winner of the 2022 Tandikam Kandawira Prize for Outstanding Scholarship in African Political Economy and Economic Development. He's a research associate at, at the um, Perivoli Africa Research Center, um, University of Bristol, and adjunct professor of African Studies at the John Hopkins University. Um, he's received and policy and management from the University of Manchester, UK. He taught African political economy and development studies at the London School of Economics and Political Science from 2017 to 2021. He also held a Matassa fellowship position at the Institute of De Development Studies in Sussex um, in 2016-2017. His research areas include Africa political economy and the politics of development the politics of knowledge production in Africa, decolonial perspectives, and young people's engagement in politics and youth unemployment. Let me hand over to you, Eob. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be with you virtually at this moment, especially being awarded a prize that's uh, named after a great person I was lucky enough to be his colleague at LSE and to have some very insightful conversation with him on a number of issues. So it's uh, an immense pleasure to be in this position in any, in any of the same. So uh, I just want to stress that and I'll just move quickly to my presentation. I try to keep it simple and I think I'm given 20 minutes. So I hope I won't be rushing, but I will try to give at least the key message of the paper that I wrote. The key driving uh, factor for me to write this paper was I, I had a number of conversations with Sandika about the Ethiopian case, he, and he kept on wondering about how Ethiopia managed to do it. And he had uh, he also had the personal encounters with the Prime Minister, the late Prime Minister Malazena who drove the Ethiopian development strategy model. And he even mentioned it in his interview with Kate Mager uh, on, one, on the journal that was published on development and change that he believed that he has influenced the Ethiopian model. So I think it's good to reflect on that. And that was the driving uh, uh, rationally behind for this paper. So I will have my key arguments first and briefly go through that Mkandwari's model and have uh, different sections to go deeper into the paper. My key arguments, uh, I have three key arguments and I'll add the fourth one in my, my conclusion, is one, the Ethiopian developmental state model that was pursued by the, the, the now defunct Ethiopian uh, ruling party, the APRDF, the developmental ideology kind of, it, it evolved from its revolutionary democracy ideology. I'll show how. Then it's also, it's an excellent example how an African state can defy the narrow market focused institutional reform and tweak it toward this pursuing developmentalist oriented, developmentalist inefficient building. And the third one is, it's all about autonomy but autonomy not only from the local, the political and economic forces, but also from international actors. So Caridev managed to pursue its developmentalist mission by cordoning of its policy space from both internal and external actors. So I hope the participants of this uh, approach workshop will, will definitely uh, go through um, Kandwari's seminar paper thinking about African development states. But these are the key issues that I want to focus on and try to link it with my presentation. One is his model has this the ideology structure nexus where he talks about it's quite important for an African developmental state to have that 
ideological orientation, developmentalist orientation, but also the structural capacity, the structural capacity to implement economic policies in a very aggressive manner because of, of course, the historical processes that put African countries in a very, very uh, disadvantaged position in, in relation to the global uh, political economy and production of commodities. And of course, autonomy is another key issue. Uh, and I have already mentioned that that's one of the arguments that I make that Ikari did manage to achieve that within the Ethiopian context. However, I think it's very important that why Ethiopia managed to do so cannot be disassociated from the fact that Ethiopia has a very, very long history of state. And what you have at the moment, the social, economic, and political institutions, of course, they have lots of uh, cost fertilization with external actors, but it has not been significantly disrupted by colonization compared to other African countries. Of course, you may have, you may definitely see the fingerprints of colonialism in its, its legacy one with the other, but there was no that kind of like 80 years of colonial domination, at least as we can see, of course, many African countries. And especially the modernist intervention, which is of course similar to the movementalist intervention started in the post-Italian occupation then since 1940s. And you have key government institutions or agencies, commissions established during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Highways, uh, airlines, railways, electric telecom, higher education institutions. And because in those periods of the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, most African states were not uh, independent enough to have that kind of uh, internally driven developmental agenda. However, there's one key structural limitation in the Ethiopian political economy setup. That's primarily the divergence, what, that's what Christopher Klaas, this is how he articulated it. It's a divergence in the source of political and economic power. Political power usually rested in historically from the central and northern highland areas, but significant amount of economic resource comes from the, the southern part or the southwestern part of the country. So the key issue, ideology. EPRDF's revolutionary democracy ideology committed itself to the transformation of the rural mass. And it tries to commit itself to improve the livelihood of the destitute rural population of Ethiopia. This is the, the, the ideological orientation that EPRDF had in the late 1980s and starting from the 1990s where it was already at the helm of the Ethiopian state. And rightly so, of course, 85% of Ethiopian population was Ethiopians were living in the rural areas. And the Ethiopian articulated more so ideologically that it's only by exploiting the abundant labor in the rural areas and the abundant land that we can transform our country because we don't have enough capital. So we can only rely on transforming our society only by utilizing what's already in our hands. So that's what the revolutionary democracy uh, interpreted its position in terms of achieving development in the and context. It has key elements of vanguard Parkism and democratic centralism. If necessary, I will get back to it later in, in the discussion. But two important elements. One, this ideology helped Ikarige to shape its relation with both internal and external actors. Internally, that's related to the vanguard part, is an issue. It helped this, it, it, the Ikarige use this, this ideology to create some kind of like, its, its own image of different political groups, especially what, what one of the politica, politician and academician, Marara Gudina says, it established a number of people's democratic organizations political parties in its own image that it can control to pursue its political agenda, and which can be easily co-opted and suppressed. And primarily most, and most importantly, externally, this uh, uh, leftist ideology helped the government 
to keep the likes of IMF and World Bank at bay from intervening into the European political economic setting, particularly pushing IMF, IMF's agenda of liberalizing the European economy in the 1990s and early 2000s. And I will be glad to share with you the materials that I'm referring to, the works of uh, Robert Ward, as well as Joseph Stiglitz uh, attest to this. And Ipiaridiev wanted to control the commanding heights of the Japan economy and keep the government as the key coordinator of the, the, the economy. But the key aspects, especially the detour for the development, the, the, the developmental orientation happened in 2001 when it's changing its, its ultimate objective for building socialist Ethiopia to building primarily capitalist market economy and changing its alliance from characterizing the compadre or national bourgeois as an enemy to, to our disconsiderance as a vital source of development and also to come up with a political program that's aimed toward this ending dependency on aid and economy, achieving economic independence. This was in 2001. And after the renewal period, especially the late prime minister designed the key development policy, the industrial policy and the two policies that I will be discussing, the rural and agricultural development policy, execution capacity uh, development policy and the foreign policy. It was primarily post 2001 that he carried it, started to, uh, to pursue this developmentalist orientation. Uh, it's interesting that it was also in 2001 that Tandika wrote that uh, important paper. Here, the two policies that I examined in this paper are this the rural and agricultural development policy, as well as the uh, capacity, execution capacity development policy. Here, IPRD they promoted the agricultural development-led industrialization policy, where it aspires to achieve a structural transformation. And of course, it followed the, like, the seminal definition of structural transformation, that is increasing productivity in the agricultural sector, where it allowed it to release the surplus labor because of high productivity and increasing, increasing the income of rural households, who will be also then be uh, the key consumers of manufactured products in the urban areas, so that there will be some kind of interdependent uh, relationship, economic relationship between the rural and the urban areas, shaping wage growth by increasing food productivity and supply, and establishing a strong back and forth linkage within the economy, particularly by promoting agro processing industries, and as well as establishing interdependent resilient domestic markets that can allow a country to be at least relatively deep, uh, independent from uh, aid. The other key element of this policy is also its commitment for broad based in transformation and development and primarily by focusing on the abundant resource. This is the key thing that the policy emphasizes we don't have enough capital what we have is abundant land and abundant labor it's only an effective utilization of what we have will allow us to build and to reach to a status where we can have more capital uh, at least like 15 14 years of executing this policy has of course some positive recurrence at least in, in in 15 or 14 years period, there were nearly 50,000 agricultural extension workers that engaged directly with farmers to introduce new inputs and new technologies and new ways of improving productivity. 9,000 farmers training centers, which is one in every two cabalists, local administrations, 15,000 health courses, 30,000 health extension workers. This is this is quite phenomenal compared to especially what you would see in many African countries in this year during the similar period. And of course, the, the quantified evaluation of the agricultural sector growth has not been that much like extraordinary, but of course, 
tangible. 11% was in the first five years and also uh, uh, almost like 5% between 2011 and 2015. Good results, but of course, with lots of room for improvement. Factors that would that may contribute to such kind of modest results can be, of course, but it's not an easy stuff, especially given the, the training, training these extension workers and also using inputs and new technologies would definitely take time. For me, the most fascinating aspect of writing this paper was going through these policy documents, the execution capacity building uh, document. It has, I would say, two key developmental features. One, it sees institution building both as a means and an end to development. And that gives that execution capacity building is an quintessential elements of institution building. The second aspect is it sees, it identifies three, uh, three forces of development, the government, the public, and the private sector. And it gives primacy for the government to lead and coordinate the other economic forces or forces of development, both the private sector and the public. And the most important feature of this policy document is its conceptualization of capacity building. That actually doesn't simply say capacity building. It's specifically focused on execution capacity building. And it defines it as a relational aspect element which emanates from transforming social relations to our decisional achieving development. And it is a, uh, almost diametrically opposite to the notion of capacity building that you usually hear among development actors or donors or agents across the world, especially at that particular period of time. That very technocratic, apolitical, and uh, like a copy pasting kind of method of building capacity was nowhere closer to this understanding of uh, capacity building. What EPRDF was talking about in that particular policy document was execution capacity is a relational, so that's something that or organically developed from social relation, political relation. It has to be contextual and also political, not just something very technocratic. And it achieved, it pursued it by particularly focusing on enhancing the capacity of the government and established a, a kind of a supra ministry called Ministry of Capacity Building. And what you see here, particularly, I would, I would emphasize is that if you look into Tandika's work and also uh, Peter Evans' work about institutional monotasking and monocoping, where the idea of capacity building was just simply replicating the institutional settings of Western countries into African political economy, what you see is an exact opposite of that. And instead of just simply passing institutions to one particular aspect as well as just simply copy pasting what you, you have in the Western wallet, it tries to create institutions that will allow it to pursue its developmentalist orientation. A good example with this regard is this major uh, program funded by the World Bank, the Public Sector Capacity Building Program. As any World Bank program, it has a very technocratic approach of you know, enhancing it with the principle, the good governance principles of inclusion, accountability, and cohesion, uh, and in, enhancing government's efficiency in service delivery and uh, in ensuring downward accountability. However, what ICARB managed to, to do is to use this like donor funded program to its advantage and kind of it grabbed it and make it its own and install its own political agenda and managed to completely change the ultimate outcome of the program. By the end of the program, what did it be, what uh, the government managed to do was to ensure that the government is quite has consolidated its capacity to control citizens' engagement in many ways. 
instead of uh, download accountable, it's a part accountable to ensure effective ways of, you know, top down channeling of policies. And instead of, you know, ensuring participatory processes, it's instead more of a consensus based relation of, uh, of policy making and uh, uh, public mobilization than the one that's the world back intended to ensure that's more focused on contestation and democratic opening. So this is where you see that what Tandika was talking about, the capacity to implement economic policies in a very aggressive and effective manner definitely needed strong institutional mechanism and he carried a pursuit that saw this policy. And the orientation, the conceptualization of the policy was quite phenomenal. A key aspect, I wouldn't spend more here, autonomy, of course, if Karadev managed to have some kind of autonomy, uh, legal and policy frameworks, especially in the finance sector, so uh, financial repression, it managed to raise around $2.8 billion in a period of nine years, and also political legal frameworks that would allow it to suppress uh, civil and political rights by suppressing civil society organizations, private media institutions, and opposition groups. Of course, it carried the opposite. A purely authoritarian region. Balance sheets. I don't want to simplify it. I don't want to be. I don't want to be too simplistic about it. But these two graphs, uh, I think, will give us a good summary of what the Ethiopian experiment of building developmental state has managed to do, especially. I can see that my time is up, and I think I'm left with only three slides. Especially since 2000, if you see, there was like a good increase of uh, the GDP, the GDP growth rate. And of course, it's not something, of course, these kinds of measurements are not, uh, are not deep enough to give us the details, but you definitely capture the overall image. This is the most important figure that I would like to show you. What you see here is the share of proper expenditure in the Ethiopian GDP. Almost for the consecutive years, you had we had like almost at least 60%, around 69%, the average is around 69%. 69% of real expenditure was on areas of education, health, agriculture, roads, and water. And it's primarily because of this developmentalist orientation. And not only the orientation, but the political drive, the politically crafted institutional mechanisms allowed the PRD, not only just to simply pump money into the public sector or in these proper uh, uh, sectors, but to effectively improve people's lives. And of course, there are many uh, records that show that there has been significant improvement in, in the Human Development Index, given, including meeting the key aspects of the Millennium Development Goals in the, the pre-2015 period. I'm almost there. Uh, of course, Mala now is the brain behind this. And this is his famous, the quote that I, I enjoy most, where he says, development is a political process first and an economic and social process after. And it's by creating that political setup that I would allow a particular government to pursue developmentalist orientation. Of course, if you already have helped manage to create that political setup that would allow it to pursue development in such aggressive manner. However, however, I cannot emphasize this enough, that drive of setting the political setup of pursuing developmentalism was against the formal institutional mechanism of, uh, the formal institutional set, set up of the country, particularly the ethno-linguistic based decentralized federalism that the itself installed in the 1995 constitution. And that inherent contradiction is for me, 
the key factor for what we see in today's Ethiopia, the abandonment of the developmentalist model and also the entire political crisis that we see at the moment. So in conclusion, of course, I think I've already demonstrated that it was the, the evolution of the revolutionary democracy that become quite important in the developmentalist aspiration. And it defied that narrow technocratic approach of institution building and move toward this a very contextual, the relational and political process of institution building. It managed to keep and at least to manipulate even uh, external policy actors and also internal actors. But most importantly, the political process that has enabled the PRD to install and pursue developmentalism become part of the problem because the, the way that political contestation was organized, particularly along ethno-linguistic lines in the period for the composite party where you have more incentive to be to push ethno-linguistic agenda than that uh, broader national uh, orientation. And that's where we see the key stumbling block that the period of drive for developmentalism couldn't pass. And that's what see in today's Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Insightful presentation. I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker, um, Ayabonga Kawe, who is winner of the Young is a Johannesburg-based development economist, author, columnist, broadcaster, and activist. He is managing director of NBC Holdings, a platform involved in advisory facilitation and content development across a wide range of fields. He hosts Metro FM Talk on Metro FM and writes a regular column for Business Day and is a part-time special advisor to Minister Patel at the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. <clears throat> Ayabonga has previously worked as an economic justice manager at Oxfam South Africa and working on um, policy advocacy and research while he was there. Um, Ibonga has previously sat on the National Minimum Wage Advisory Panel, um, which we're looking into proposals around a minimum wage. And um, he is also currently serves as a member of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council, which is chaired by President Ramaphosa. He's a lecturer at the School of Economic and Economics and Finance at um, University of Advertisement and holds a Master of Commerce in Development Theory and Policy from BITS. Over to you, Abang. Thank you very much, Saul. Um, good evening to you all. I was saying outside, whenever they read the bios, it sometimes feels like an obituary. Um, but uh, thank, thank you so much, Saul. Thanks to TIPS, to the Saatchi Industrial Research Chair, to APORD, the DTIC, to yourselves, uh, for the invite and also for the award. Um, it's always, I guess, a recognition of one's own economic interests and research interests. Um, and I hope I can share maybe tonight, I guess, some of what maybe happened behind the scenes in the, in the research itself. Um, I'm not gonna share any PowerPoint slides. Uh, I often say death by PowerPoint, um, but more than happy to share the notes that uh, I'll be speaking to, and I think the papers uh, has been shared as well. But maybe just as I start, uh, and I know I don't have too much time, but to maybe just reflect uh, on the work of Tandikam Kandawiri. Um, in many ways, I think he was able to carve in the space or in the universe of ideas, a very interesting space for himself. He theorized the post-colonial state as an organism that was on a historic path, rather than what is often said, this hollowed out static carcass that polices and terrorizes people, as is often suggested in the group think that one might find in the West. He understood that to theorize on development, you had to uncover the episodes and possibilities, the causes and the features of success and failure, and of course, the dramatis personae or the key actors in all of these. To understand what the impulses that drove them were and what ends motivated their actions. It was in many ways a political economy approach that was forged 
in the confines of the academy as it was in the crucible of nationalist resistance to colonialism. Now, those are some notes from, um, I guess, an, an unpublished tribute um, that I wrote to Mdom Dala as, um, on his passing a few years ago. Um, and, and in many ways, I guess it was a real honor to have been thought of as firstly a recipient and a contender in the prize and let alone to win it. Um, and a big part of what I try to write about and really theorize and think about in, in this piece, which is titled Delang Ogbona, um, is really to try and make sense in a very meaningful way of what happens in a political economy when violence is used in particular ways to access economic rents, but also what complicating factors arise in a society that is as unequal as South Africa is, and that is still riven apart by all manner of uh, divisions on class, race, gender, and even spatial divisions as well. So the starting point in the analysis was to first try and make sense of capital spending, in particular capital spending on infrastructure. And the reason for this is really simple. A big part of what we've seen even in the COVID-19 moment are large pledges and commitments of large infrastructure spend to try and recover the economy or to make sure that there's an uptick in economic activity uh, because of the features that construction has, relatively lower barriers to entry and advance, you know, um, from an employment perspective, um, but also the stimulus that it gives to other subsectors of the economy, steel, cement, aluminium, um, and many other secondary industries in the economy. But also I think that at a theoretical level, the motivations were, you know, coming certainly nearly 10 years now from a piece I'd read in the Premium Times, a Nigerian publication. Um, and uh, a so Nigerian sociologist, Ebenezer Obadare, wrote a piece titled, How Asari Dokubo Became a Big Man. Um, and I think those in the room who know something about the Niger Delta uh, will know who Asari Dokubo is. Um, and of course, the role that he and many of his colleagues and comrades were involved in in disrupting the oil pipeline in Nigeria and effectively how they were ultimately paid off. Um, so that was a big motivation. And I also think the work of Douglas North on limited access orders uh, was also part of the assisting, I guess, theoretical frame around this. But what do I mean when I talk about Delang Ogbon? Well, effectively, these are groups, according to an executive at Sandral, that are very much a construction mafia. They are uninterested in formal tendering or subcontracting processes. They arrive in a pickup van, fire shots in the air, demand their share, burn equipment, push workers in front of moving traffic, and in some cases even do worse. But I argue that the construction mafia as a term is an unhelpful analytical reference because what it does is that it focuses on the tactics used by a diverse set of groups rather than the essence of this is a political economy phenomenon that signals frustration with the slow pace of formal avenues of economic transformation and empowerment. In the Sunday papers over the last day, last few days or so, uh, there was a very interesting piece on protection rackets, both in the formal and the informal sector, on public projects and even on private sector projects. Um, and many recurring themes arise there but not all of them would be characterized as the Delang Ogbona phenomenon. What distinguishes this phenomenon is its use of the language of broad-based Black economic empowerment as an avenue to access economic rents. And section nine of the 2017 preferential procurement regulations indicates that for projects valued at 30 million Rand or more, um, and where feasible, there should be subcontracting on those projects. Um, and of course, the 30% demand arises from that Schedule 9. So if you ask anybody in South Africa, who are the 30 percenters, they will tell you who those people are. Um, and they've become notorious because of the scale of some of the projects, billions of rands and infrastructure projects 
uh, the type of stuff my colleague was talking about earlier on, which have been disrupted because there is the impression at a community level that there aren't adequate measures to ensure participation of small and medium-sized enterprises as the policy requires. So I consider in the paper the informal and at times violent mobilization of the theory, language, and policy tools of Black economic empowerment, in particular via preferential procurement, in an approach that provides a framework to try and understand the social risks that confront an economic reconstruction and recovery program that is focused on an aggressive infrastructure board. These disruptions are only possible because there are particular features in the post-apartheid political economy in South Africa. These include a crisis in the ability of the state to exercise a monopoly on violence, enduring organizational mobility around traditional, ethno-national and other institutions, broad disunity in the elite coalition, and declining economic rent opportunities. And the paper goes to some length in defining the theoretical vantage point from which a lot of these arguments emerge in the literature on economic rents. But also, I think if there's anything else that one might take from the remarks that uh, Professor Tandikam Kandawira made uh, Saul on that day in 2012, in his discussion uh, on distributive conflicts is that they have a particular political economy. And in South Africa, where you still have concentrated product and service markets, significant barriers to entry, and where incorporation or entry takes on deep historic and, uh, and, uh, 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 historic and uh, contemporary significance due to the centuries of exclusion of the African and black majority in South Africa. In a sense, we might want to think of broad-based black economic empowerment as a rent, not in the traditional sense uh, of the Krugers and others, but also as something that is able to subvert the historic narrative or the historic differential value apportioned to black people and their terms of incorporation and advance in the economy. It's a rent in a way or a mechanism for the distribution of economic rents to those who have historically been marginalized and excluded. Yet in design, what we find is that even the most well-meaning policies have significant misalignment of intent and practice. The 2017 regulations, if you were to apply them in the strict sense, would certainly not provide corresponding opportunities for rent distribution to the kind of firms that often are found disrupting many of these projects. Let's do a bit of arithmetic. If you are only able to access 30%, so if you follow the letter of the law, 30% on a project that is of 30 million in value, that's the contract value, then it means according to the Construction Industry Development Board, the CIDB's grading system, that you should have at least done a project in value that is about 9 million rand or so. Yet when we analyze the CIDB's register of contractors, especially black contractors, level one, um, it's a bit better, I guess, for the 51% black owned and above, but level one, what we find is that the overwhelming majority of level one contributors who have a grading that allows them to qualify for work of the value of 9 million rand in the least are primarily located in the urban core of South Africa, Johannesburg, Tswane, and Etegui. And if you go even to some of the smaller metros, Mangaung, Buffalo City, um, Nelson Mandela Bay, you don't find those contractors getting to a grading that in the formal sense would allow them to benefit from some of these big projects. So that's, that's the first dynamic that explains this phenomenon. The second one is that we have seen across the state-owned entities and even in many of the municipalities who within the state are the main spenders on infrastructure, declining project sizes, declining volumes of projects over the last few years or so, and similarly in the private sector as well. So in a sense, as Fanon often says, um, the spoils are becoming leaner, but it seems the vultures are becoming a lot more voracious. There's a bigger contestation around a, a declining piece 
uh, of the pie, if I can put it that way. The second issue, of course, which is around the failure of the state to exercise an effective monopoly on violence, is that we've seen in the work, of course, of uh, North, Wallace and Weingast, that the interest of all parties sometimes is to maintain the peace. But in this case, the interest of all parties, least of all some of the main contractors and the project owners who are confronted with cost overruns, who are confronted with time overruns as well, is sometimes to engage At some stage, if there isn't utility in the law enforcement response for whatever capacity reasons, there is then an incentive to engage and in some cases to pay off certain groupings who have a capacity for violence or present a credible enough threat of violence or have undertaken violence in the past. And we're seeing in many places like Guazulu Natal even organize large listed construction firms who are beginning to say, let's rather bank this and effectively, you know, put it in our numbers as we go forward. But also what has happened is that many of these groups have taken on a contradictory posture. They've taken on a formal sense when it suits them as effective gatekeepers of um, entry into large procurement projects for small and medium sized enterprises as effective enforcers sometimes of bylaws, um, much in the mold of Operation Tutula, if I can say that. But in some cases, the operative use and the instrumentality of violence is still something that is very much an option. And it seems that many of those who have explored public and private options to uh, get a formal response from the authorities um, have later revealed some preference to cooperate with many of the business forums who use this tactical approach. I think maybe the last two comments I want to make is that there is also something else that drives this more radical and alternative interpretation of broad-based Black economic empowerment and preferential procurement policy. And it arises because of deep disunity in the elite coalition, and in particular in the governing Congress Alliance in South Africa. And what we see in the composition of some of these groups organized around this Delangogbona approach is the presence of historical groupings within that Congress Alliance. You tend to see the Condoleezza or Military Veterans Association and certain groupings within the African National Congress, and in some cases, the South African Communist Party. Uh, who are part of these groups. But also there's a contradictory ideological framework if we are to take this ideology state nexus in that while there might be radical interpretation of well-meaning and progressive policy in so far as procurement is concerned, the same groupings will stand on one leg in defense, for instance, of the Ingonyama Trust uh, or the land of uh, primordial institutions like traditional authority and chieftaincy in the same vein when the debate of expropriation of land without compensation is raised. So in a sense, there's a contradictory posture here. On the one hand, we want to use preferential procurement to open up the economy and facilitate inclusion. But on the other hand, there are certain groupings whose established interests in the particular political economy are defended in this kind of way. Now, what do we then do? Well, I think the first is to accept that this presents a crisis of credibility for formal redistributive mechanisms in South Africa. Broad-based Black economic empowerment, as we understand it, is in a moment of crisis. And I think the first part of the crisis is a crisis of its trickle-down assumption that you could find a few people who would be a proxy for the overwhelmingly economically excluded majority, and that that would be a system that would not only buy particular political insurance for established interests, but that would maintain the peace. That peace. I think the second one is also a deep challenge on this conception of a unitary state. Part of the thing that Delang Ogbona approach uses is to say, we want, if this contract is happening in Guamash, we don't want people from Chatsworth or people from Chesterville to come and benefit. 
or if it's happening in New Brighton, I don't want people who are coming from Zuite to come and benefit. If it's happening in Toyando, I don't want people from Malamlele to come and benefit. If it's in Mamelodi, not far from here, I don't want people who are coming from Soshanguve to come and benefit. And yet the spirit and the letter of the law when it was written defined local value distribution, be it in local content, be it in employment opportunities, be it in subcontracting opportunities in a much wider scope than just that local. I think the other point is that without confronting concentrated product and service markets, there will be no end to the political credibility of this approach, which uses the instrument of violence as a politics of entry. If it remains difficult to access particular subsectors of the economy, least of all contracts of the size that we're talking about here, there will always be a credible politics behind some of this violence. And of course, the other things are bring the projects online quicker. One of the things that we find, for instance, in the Eastern Cape is whenever there are findings by the Auditor General of projects, nine times out of 10, the findings also relate to non-compliance with local content and SMME inclusion in large infrastructure projects down at a municipal level. Somebody sits in supply chain, they sign the thing, no regard to local content or monitoring it, no regard to ensuring that there's some opportunity for participation for SMMEs. So the problem is not only in the private sector, but also within the, the public sector as well. And then I think the last comment is really, in addition to the redesign of procurement systems and frameworks, is that there has to be an open discussion about the renegotiation of the orbit of rent distribution in South Africa. It's going to have to require, as we've done historically, be it on the eve of the 1994 elections or even much earlier, contending with those who have the potential or capacity for violence within the state and its elite coalition and outside of it. Because if we do not do that, then any approach to an infrastructure-led recovery and aggressive one at that will be put to nil because many people will be watching from the sidelines. And of course, then there are, I guess, open pickings for the opportunistic, the excluded, and even the criminal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, excellent lecture. Thank you. I think you held everyone enthralled with that. I think excellent research and thank you for presenting it and sharing it with the group. Um, and very relevant and topical to what we've been discussing over the last week and a half. Um, I'm going to open for questions or comments. There's also an opportunity for uh, online participants to post questions in the chat if there are any questions. Let me start with the participants in the room. Do you want to raise your hand if you've got questions? Good evening. My name is Yandea Mashau and I work for the DTIC. Um, in your presentation, uh, you spoke about uh, uh, the disjuncture between uh, local government and national government uh, when it comes to the implementation of uh, uh, local content. So I just want to find out from you, uh, how can we ensure coherence in policy? Because I think in many instances, we find that companies will get tenders in local municipality and, um, and get away with everything. And then the next thing, they will come to the DTI, see to um, speak to our DG or the minister to ask for um, uh, to ask for um, I mean, exemption from compliance with this policy. So how do we ensure coherence in policy between uh, local municipality and national government? Thank you. Any other questions? Here we go. Thank you um, to both the speakers, very insightful uh, presentations. And I uh, thank you for your presentation as well. Um, Towards the end, I was, I was becoming a bit worried when you were not talking to the disintegration or the divisions or the fractions within <laughs> ANC. I was like, why would you leave that out? But there's another part that I, I feel like you left out and I'm, I'm just wondering whether it's deliberate or it was not part of the discourse. The issue of also violence within parliament as well as a... As a 
I don't know whether to say an informal way to push for a voice in a formal setting. I, I'm not sure how you point it, but um, yeah, you totally ignored that. Um, so was it deliberate? Was it, yeah, thank you. Oh, my apologies, I'm Nontombi Marule. <laughs> I also work for the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Gatima Temba, South Africa. I work for the South African Bureau of Standards. So thanks for the presentations. So, so all I can indicate that um, I only used to hear Ayabonga's voice only on radio. <laughs> so it's my privilege to, to see you today, Chief. Yeah. Um, mine is yesterday and today, we were in session where it was shared with us on issues around governance and corruption. And I think at the center of it, two issues that were also flagged among many was the concept of uh, rule of law and uh, rule by law. These are the things that we debated extensively here. And in your talk, you eloquently outlined what procurement officials do in the signing off of these tenders or bid evaluations, wherever they are. And what was clear in the lecture, lectures for yesterday and today was the lack of punishment. Lack of punishment for those who are known to be contravening the policies or procedures or the rules. I would like to know what is your perspective in this regard for these individuals that we know that they do these things. I can confirm uh, that Ayabonga, in my line of duty, among other things, local content verification is what you do. And it is very surprising that a tender has been awarded and declarations have been made by individuals who claim that the product in question that they've tended for, it has some threshold of local content in it as per the regulations as you have outlined in line with the instruction notes that is in question. But come verification process time when the soldiers are on the ground, there is no traceability of local content. And these people are there. So unfortunately as officials, what we do, I always say we mark our exam, we issue the report, and you report to the officials, but there is a missing step once we have reported. And these reports are generated from time to time, but for some reason, I don't think there is enough follow through. Thank you. So let's maybe take the one on the platform. Um, uh, the hand, I saw a hand, but it went down. Okay, I think it's, they must have changed their minds. Okay, sure. Yeah, eh? I, I thought I was here to discuss a paper, but it seems I'm on the hook for some of my thoughts now. Yo, okay. Um, let me start with Nontombi's question about parliament. I don't think what we see in parliament is unique in the society. One of the things I say in the paper is there's a particular utility of violence, now utility in the economic sense. Violence plays a function or else people would not use it. You hear in South Africa when there's a protest and they ask, well, why did you burn the library? Well, why did you, you know, why did you beat up the scab labor if the workers were on strike? And oftentimes communities will say, well, people will not listen to us if we're not violent. So in a sense, violence is a language. And if you have a moderate and a very nice picket, your memorandum is delivered, you are heard, everybody goes home and has lunch and keep it moving. But it seems the only things that get attention and get a state response are those 
that are characterized by significant and a judicious use of violence. Um, and I don't think that that is something that is unique to parliament. I don't think it's unique to the Delangobona phenomenon, nor do I think it's unique. I mean, we even see violence in churches now. There's different factions in a church start to you know, bring guns into, into their divisions and so on. Um, not only because they want to resolve those things, but they feel that the other side will be intimidated enough to do what it is that they want them to do. And I think in this case, it's exactly for the same purpose. There's a sense that contractors will be intimidated enough, not only by the violence itself, but by the implication of the opportunity cost of delay and disruption to come to the party. Um, you know, it always works the same way, right? You go in, um, you ask for a meeting, and this is what people are saying to us. You ask for a meeting, the company says, no, we don't want to meet with you. Who are you? Okay, fine. The next morning, you have people standing there with AK-47s. And then you give one of the workers the phone and you say, call the boss. When they call the boss, boss, there are these people here, we can't work today. They're carrying arms, blah, 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 blah. Will you not have a meeting? As a contractor, you're on the hook for a project. Will you not have the meeting? You'll have the meeting. Whether or not you will see to the demand or not is something entirely different. But, and I say in an instance where you have this wild, wild west where there's deep incapacitation of the police service, then people's relative assessment of the returns to violence, you know, are skewed, right? I mean, why in July were people willing to be seen on camera with, you know, five kilograms of sunflower oil? at the risk of being arrested. Because the relative returns of doing that and the lack of punitive sanction, my brother, is what leads to that. Um, and I'll come back to that one. Um, Ms. Mashao, uh, it seems every, all, all the people from the campus so are the ones asking the questions. Um, yeah, it's quite concerning. Look, I mean, I think, I think the issue of coherence you're raising is very important. And maybe we might want to take a step back. Within the government system, the two in spheres of government or institutions that have the highest capital budgets, and if you can disaggregate that, and I try and do that in the paper, and I compare new construction works, spend on new construction works, um, and compare national government, provincial government, state-owned companies, and municipalities. Municipalities and state-owned companies by far have the largest share than national and provincial government, even though the division of revenue works in, in another way. Uh, but of course, there's significant allocations in the system from national and provincial government to local authorities, which is where the spending happens. And I, I guess this is what this district development model is trying to resolve. But I don't think it's going to resolve it unless we confront what I call the juniorization of supply chain functions. You know, if you're interested in industrial policy, you can't juniorize your supply chain function. You can't have a situation where somebody opts to be a junior official for 12 years. They ask, why don't you want a promotion? They say, no, I don't want a promotion. Then you know why, right? Um, but if you fail to see a critical execution function in how you procure that supply chain function is critical to your industrial policy. Then you can design the most favorable local content policy, but it will never be given effect to. So there is a big need to reestablish and reopen what it means to have a supply chain function in an SOC and what it means to have it in a municipality. What kind of capabilities and what kind of caliber people do you want in there? But also, it's not just about that stage, that, because that stage is just the design stage specifications, and then of course, putting it out on tender. The biggest problem we have in our municipalities is the absence of sector departments post the award of the tender. They're not there. So they might sit in adjudication committee, decide, okay, Katima will get the tender, but then five months down the line, when we need to check actually are things happening on site, they are busy elsewhere, or the person who was there is no longer there, and also, you know, you must remember in our government, we're in Hollywood, right? A lot of people who are acting. You are acting this, you are acting that, you are, 
You see, Saul, this is what I was saying. I didn't want to, uh, to, to, to get into some of the controversial things, but we need to fix that. Because if we don't fix it, we then tend to think that our policy challenge is just in the formulation and articulation of the policy. Often say, yeah, you know, we have brilliant policies in South Africa, we can't implement them. Well, if your policies are difficult to implement, then you might wanna ask how good they are. Because as you design, you kind of have to be thinking about what happens in monitoring and, and in the evaluation process. Which I think comes to Katima's question. Um, look, I think the lack of punitive sanction is one part of it. Uh, I think the law has a particular framing of how that sanction must happen. But at the end of the day, it's people who make the decisions on the basis of their own assessment of the relative power or resistance that might come from saying, Kadiva, we see you're a habitual offender. Every year there are findings in this department because of you, right? Now, if I know, but Kadiva is strong in the house, I can't deal with him. Um, or you have this acting situation and the turnstile then there will never be enough institutional memory and political will to deal with some of those issues. That's the first thing. But the second thing I think we really need to think about, is our procurement system creating this incentive? Micro parcels procurement. That assumes procuring a pen is the same as procuring a train, right? It's all the same. Now, if you've got that kind of system, you are never gonna have a procurement system that allows you to build long-term industrial capability. Because every single time you're procuring, you're acting like you're meeting the market for the first time. You know, you have municipalities who buy toilets every year, rural sanitation backlog. They go out on tender every year. So now my question then is, if you're going out on tender every year, what are you hoping to discover that you didn't see in 2013 about who's in the market? When ideally what we should be doing is to say, can we have long-term and programmatic forms of procurement that embedded in them have a reci reciprocal expectation? You are not gonna get a tender for toilets if you can't show that there's some upstream capability that you are building that allows by year five, all of that to come from here. You are not gonna get a certain contract so, so there needs to be this re reciprocal form of contracting that comes into play that is expressly linked, not just with local content verification and a tick box, but that is also actually about saying, the signal here is that we're giving you a rent. And in return for that rent, we want it to be a productive rent. We don't want it to be a rent that leads to capital flight or a rent that leads to you know, unproductive and conspicuous spend. We want it to be, a, and what ends up happening if you, with what we do now is that we micro parcel projects and we create the space for middle people who will come and I'm the one you're buying from, but actually behind me, there's another middle person who is then going and getting the stuff from Guangzhou. And I think if we're interested really in doing away with the use of public money to incentivize an unproductive middle layer in procurement, then we might want to think about moving away from a system where we buy a glass of water in the same way as we think we can buy maybe a stadium. Thank you. Um, are there any more hands? One, two, um, let me just, is there anyone online? And I also wanted to give an opportunity to Aob to also share some of his insights also in, in response to um, the other presentation or any of the questions that have come up. Um, so let me take the two last hands, and then we're going to move to wrapping up the session. Hi, uh, my question is to, uh, my name is Joe, uh, I'm an African. Uh, my, my question is uh, directed to Comrade Ayo. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I find your presentation, first of all, very refreshing in the sense that uh, it's good to see uh, some evidence of agricultural uh, led growth. Uh, and uh, Ethiopia seems to be doing that. And I'm glad that you are providing, I don't know if you're aware of the program here in Apod. Everything has been about industrialization. Um, and it's just good to see 
a different perspective, which I sort of uh, hope could be a good example for many of us uh, who are working in different policies in different parts of the continent. But my question is, how do you respond to structuralists who are obsessed with manufacturing uh, in the sense that they'll tell you that your suggested or your experience in Ethiopia is not sustainable uh, because it does not include uh, manufacturing. And I was just looking at some statistics. Uh, in Ethiopia, you have a huge uh, fraction of manufacturing and now services uh, you know, as a percentage of GDP. But how do you respond to those that tell you that uh, since manufacturing doesn't have such a big presence in your formula to growth, then it's not sustainable and it's gonna collapse soon. Thank you. Ayabonga and the colleague who presented online. My name is Abiel Mutlatu from the DTIC. My question is basically on the unitary challenge of the state on the local local compared to local within the geographical boundaries. Uh, we see this happening both in the mining industry, whereby they say local must be defined by the shadow of, of, of the shaft. Is this not caused by the untransformed structure of our economy? Is this not caused by the deep level of unemployment, poverty and inequality? I'm asking the question of inequality, knowing that the solution is not quality, uh, equality, but social justice. Over the, the two weeks or one and a half week, we spoke about everything, but what is missing is the education of the citizen. Is it not that a starting point to say, as an agent, over time, their citizen must be educated so that they cannot lose their agency. Uh, I want to hear uh, Avonga's uh, views on, based on these things. Thanks. Over to you, Ayo. Okay, thank you, Mr. Madoweta. Uh, and I totally enjoyed the presentation by Avong and uh, I didn't read the paper, but at least from the presentation, I, I learned a lot. I cannot really make any substantive comment, I was just simply learning and probably I will I look forward to reading the paper and probably uh, just improve my understanding of some of the local context that way, some of the South Africa specific context that she was responding to and also the questions. Uh, going to the specific question that was directed towards me about manufacturing and The way that the Ethiopian economy, even though over the past 15 years has been on a positive track, it couldn't really improve the, the share of the manufacturing sector in the GDP. And of course, that's a, a huge problem. And I understand where you're coming from when you say, since you don't have that, so it will definitely collapse. Uh, that's that's a fair understanding of the process. However, however, I think it's also important to understand the structural impediments that African economies have whenever they try to transform their economy. You may have a manufacturing sector, a thriving manufacturing sector that is just producing goods for export, which I think is not always good. What we see, what we see from the Ethiopian context is focusing on what Ethiopia has in abundance. That's primarily labor and land. Of course, the objective is trans to transform the agricultural sector so that it feeds into the manufacturing sector by providing 
surplus labor from the agricultural sector by releasing labor from the rural community into the towns, into the cities where they can be absorbed. And also to have, to generate sufficient uh, hard currency, either to buy capital goods or technology. Because to, to have a manufacturer-based economy, you need skilled labor. You need resources, either natural resources or processed resources. You need technology. You need capital. And you cannot get everything at once. It's definitely a process. And what Ikari Dave managed to do or aspired to do once it came to power in 1990s is instead of just, just to simply uh, you know, plan your economy based on what you don't have, it's just trying to focus on what it has under its control. Because you may have key actors, like who's going to engage in manufacturing? Manufacturing needs strong government intervention to provide incentives for the private sector to engage into that and you know, capitalize on the incentives. But what you have in many African countries is a private sector that thrives on just simply exporting unprocessed goods and just simply importing uh, manufactured products. Because you will, in that way, they can make money quick, they can, you know, generate enough revenue just to keep on benefiting from the process. But unless you incentivize them to move into manufacturing, where the returns might not be as quick as just simply exporting products and importing finished products, and unless you use policy mechanisms as both the carrot and stick to incentivize them, to push them, as well as to build your human resource capacity. You definitely need skilled labor. And that skilled labor needs at least like affordable living condition, affordable commodity food supplies. And you cannot just simply import food from outside unless you have a, a locally produced commodities that can uh, be supplied into, into the food market. So, it's not a matter of just simply focusing on manufacturing. It's for me, it's quite important for us to understand the existing structural impediments of a particular economy so that even your aspiration for industrialization cannot just simply rely on the on the just simply exporting into the external market. But one thing that African economies is for the last 40, 50 decades, including the Lagos Plan of Action of the 1980. Clearly articulated is that the key structural challenge of African economies is that we produce what we don't consume and we consume what we don't produce. Manufacturing can be a solution for these kinds of processes only if you have sufficient institutional mechanisms, policy mechanisms, and also skill level that will allow you to benefit from the huge market that the domestic market, not of course all African countries, at least in the Egyptian context, there's a huge market that can benefit from that. So of course the manufacturing has not been performing significantly, but I believe the solution, like the policy option that you carry put in place, the agricultural development led industrialization approach was right policy at that time, but of course it needed some kind of uh, tweaking and evolution as, as it goes uh, along uh, a longer time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bonga, last comments from you, and then we'll wrap up. No, just, just a brief one, and, and thank you so much for the calm uh, question. Mr. Mslasone? Yo, okay. So, so I think the issue of, um, Local, local, I think appears as people are making agitation for localized systems of preference in tenders. But we often tend to conflate it also with the question of local content, which I think we've been discussing here. Um, and a few weeks ago, the acting director general in the National Treasury made it very clear that when 
local is referred to in policy frameworks, it means South Africa as a whole. So you could get somebody coming in from Cape Town and that person is local where we are now. I think I'm slightly conflicted on this one and I'll tell you why. I hear the argument being made by the business forums and even by AfriForum who are saying, you need a system of localized areas of emphasis and preference in the tenders so that you recognize that there is an inequity in the spatial distribution of where production happens and of where jobs are. And that's an outcome of our history. The chopping up of South Africa into the Republic and the different TBVC states has created a system where there are differences in the productive and manufacturing base across the country. So in a sense, when you're saying local, it might make sense to create these local systems of preference as they have in the mining sector. But what do you give away in doing that? Well, you give away this entire vision, which I think for the first time in 1994 was a qualitative advance, be it from pre-union, the Union of South Africa and even apartheid South Africa, of for the first time having a unitary state in South Africa territorially. You give, you give that away. Um, now, the other element to it, of course, in the mining sector, which is quite contradictory, is if the shadow of the shaft is the local, and you know the overwhelming majority in some commodity types of your labor component is migrant labor, can we expand local beyond geospatially the shadow of the shaft? I think these are questions policy will have to respond to. Um, but, I, but I don't think you're going to be able to resolve the issue of uneven distribution of where economic activity happens in South Africa without creating some systems of preference that recognize that there's differential you know, infrastructure, availability, production, uh, and so on across the country. I mean, the fact that you know, the floods, even the riots that we saw affected that main artery exporting and bringing imports into the entire region, not just the country, which is the N3 or what used to be called the Natal Corridor, shows that we are vulnerable and that you need to diversify where productive activity happens, not just in South Africa, but in the entire region as well. So I think you are right. A lot of it is caused by inequality. A lot of it is caused by the fact that many sectors are still characterized by dominant market actors who use their power in particular ways, concentrated sectors, high barriers to entry, difficult to succeed once you're in and so on. Um, but I think where procurement can play a role, we kind of have to be cautious about how we define that local. Because if we do it, I think in the way some people are suggesting, uh, then you might play into the hand of the federalists. Uh, and I think, you know, a big part of um, certainly the post-colonial and post-apartheid struggle in this country has been about creating a unitary state. And if you know, people can create their own fiefdoms. Um, it might be a political outcome that I, I find a bit difficult to accept. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the questions, the speakers and the insightful responses from, from both of you. I think we've had a really insightful discussion, useful and, and pushes our thinking a bit. Um, so thank you to everyone for your participation. Thank you to the people who joined us online. And um, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thanks, good night. <laughs>